Hello readers, I'm Diaby Drilla and today we're reviewing Economics in One Lesson, written by Henry Hazlitt in 1946. So this is a very old economics textbook, came out right after World War II, and it deals with a lot of economic fallacies, it debunks a lot of them. And I think this is the perspective of the Austrian school that Henry Hazlitt gives here, so it is hard to find any fault with this book, it's like Hayek, they explain everything pretty well and they don't make any absurd claims really. So. He discusses a couple dozen fallacies or a couple dozen topics or so. And the first part is a lesson which explains that a good economist should look at a policy in how it affects everybody, general things, in the long term, instead of just looking at one group short term. And the general conclusion usually is most government policies, they may benefit one group short term, but in the end, they really screw everyone over long term. And you can say, the converse is true often, that a lack of policy may hurt someone in the short term, but will benefit everyone in the long term, probably. And one of the first lessons you could say is that whenever government spends anything or does anything, it costs money. So you will pay this through taxes in one form or another. So if you want public works, then you need taxes. And the three ways of raising taxes, you've got you levy taxes, which regular taxes, you borrow money, credit which is you make debt so you will pay future taxes and then also there is inflation which is a tax on everyone and all of these things are taxes in a sense since they take money from people involuntarily and one of the first thing he talks about is the broken window fallacy so when you break a window sure it may create a new job but that money that was used to pay to repair the window will not be used for example to buy a new suit so whenever you raise costs of doing something you are making things less efficient and you are inhibiting the choices that people make in making purchases where demand is and also whenever the government does something such as taking out credit which is that it is diverting production to something less efficient probably so for example when you put a tariff on something to inculcate an industry at home what you're actually doing is making everyone pay extra for that industry at home and then you have for example five dollars that's this spent on your local industry that could have been saved and spent on something more efficient. So whenever you impose a new tariff or a tax, you get basically less bang for your buck. And one of the conclusions of this is you shouldn't stop the development of machines which make things more efficient. Because sure, someone may lose one's job, but it is usually a positive sum game. So if you lose your job in that sector, you can go work in another one. And the thing with development is people need to work less and less and they can buy more bang for the buck so it isn't necessarily ideal to have full employment or that everyone should work a lot it is actually more efficient in the long term that through development you have to work less and you get paid more through the goods you receive but this cannot be forced by government this only occurs when new technologies develop which make machinery or the production of things more efficient the important thing with production is how can you produce more by spending less and when a company manages to do that, almost everyone benefits from this. And one thing government shouldn't do is try to create jobs for the sake of creating jobs. Because when the government does so, then there are less employees in a sector that would be more efficient for the economy and for the individual and for society. And you can have public employees, sure, for a specific purpose, but not for creating jobs. So if you need a bridge, that's fine. Henry Hazlitt argues, but you shouldn't just create the bridge to create employment. You create the bridge for the bridge's sake, not for the sake of the employees. So we should get rid of a lot of these bureaucrats that already exist and deregulate some things. And sure, you will have some temporarily unemployment, but these works lead to unemployment often in other ways that you don't think about. And Hazlitt also explains that this obsession with exports is done since when you export something, you actually permit another country to export something to you. So to be able to import things, you need to export other things because of the different currencies of the world. So if you want to buy Japanese goods, you have to buy it with yen, while if the Japanese want to buy American goods, they have to have dollars. So in effect, when you make exports, you are then able to get imports 
and get cheaper goods. So that's the point of trade. Everyone gets cheaper goods from everyone else. And sure, it may hurt some industries at home, but for the benefit of everyone else. Another thing is that price fixing creates distortions in the economy and can cause unemployment or shortages or surpluses for different things. So when you have rent control, then you incentivize less building of new homes because they decay of such places. And the thing with these different controls is that they're often on the poor so the poor have to pay for them while they're not on the rich so if you have rent control for poor neighborhoods and the builders will just go to the rich ones where they will actually get their incomes because people are self-interested so if you put bottlenecks in their ways to making profits or money then you're screwing the poor that you're trying to help since they will go to the rich and make their money there instead. Another thing is when you price fix, for example, farmers by putting the cost of their products higher than above market rates. And in a sense, you're benefiting farmers, sure, but you're screwing over everyone else and they have less money left over to purchase things they really want. And he also briefly touches upon this Marxist myth debunks a couple of them that when a worker produces something he doesn't have a right to be able to buy it back as the costs of labor they may be the majority of the costs but they're not the only costs in producing things and the price of something does not reflect the cost of it instead it reflects the situation of supply and demand so if there's a lower supply and there's a lot of demand for something prices rise so you don't have a shortage if you don't allow this you will have a shortage sometimes prices have to rise when you have a surplus then prices will go down so that more people will buy things lower prices more demand higher prices less demand and one thing we should understand at the core of this is that profits are what leads to efficiency in the economy so it's a price indicator that other people should be investing in this area so that prices will be brought down for consumers and the consumers will be better off so they are being able to get more and more bang for a buck when profits are allowed to prevail as you will have more efficiency because there's an incentive there while savings are necessary for investment into different businesses there's a myth that savings are just people hoarding away things and putting it under their bed no when you save things you usually put it in a bank or you invest in something and this leads to lower prices in the long run for everyone else and to the development of new industries and better products. And one of the final points Henry Hazlitt makes is that inflation is inherently dishonest and malicious because it's a hidden tax on everyone. But a lot of these things really affect the poor a lot more than the rich since the rich have tools at their disposal to minimize these problems. And one of the reasons inflation occurs, for example, is when unions demand more money than the market rate for their wages. And one of the ways to minimize these problems is to inflate the currency and in effect their purchasing power is not really increased and is often actually decreased. So inflation in the long run destroys the purchasing power of a lot of people. So in that sense inflation is a dishonest thing and it's actually a wage cutter or a diminishing of purchasing power. And the main goal in economics you could say with economic growth is to increase the purchasing power of society and of individuals. And when you inflate the currency you may actually decrease it. And towards the end of the book you have an epilogue kind of which discusses have any of these recommendations by Henry Lehaselet been listened to in the 30 years following this book? No, not really. So problems of inflation and things like that got much worse in the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s. Luckily, not long after you wrote this edition, you had some reforms in the 80s which destroyed these problems or got rid of them by reform and things like that. So that's the book. So how would I rate Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hassett? I would give it a 10 out of 10. It's an amazing book. You see, when I read a book, I think of, is there any flaws in this book? And similarly to the Constitution of Liberty with Hayek, I cannot really find any, barely anything. Maybe there's some minor flaw in this book, but there's nothing that can bring it down from a 10. And there's a good reason why both Hayek and Friedman have their names on the back cover here and recommending this book. It's an amazing book that explains a lot of economic fallacies well. And here, Henry Hazlitt, I think he's an Austrian economist, kind of, so he does it better, for example, than Thomas Sol, and he actually does it more clearly than Hayek, you could say. Hayek goes on these long tangents to explain different problems with government, but Henry Hazlitt explains it in clear, understandable English, so you have the 
Good thing with Hayek and the good thing with Thomas Sowell, which is clear language, combined here in this book. Actually, if I would recommend someone to read one economics book, this would be one of the top ones, Economics in One Lesson. It's really an amazing book. Basic Economics is a great book, but Economics in One Lesson is a short book, about 200 pages in big letters, and you get to debunk so many fallacies and you have a lot of arguments here for why government involvement in a lot of things is bad. So yeah, 10 out of 10. Henry Hazlitt, a great journalist and economist. So this was the Avid Reader's review of Economics in One Lesson, written by Henry Hazlitt in 1946. It got a 10 out of 10. I hope you readers enjoyed this book review and I will see you readers next time.